some folks uh, today, and, and thank you to them for, for the wonderful opportunity. Can everyone hear me okay in, in the back? Not too bad. Ooh. Now I'm going to be right. Yes. <laughs> how about how about now? Is is that a bit better? Oh yeah, like okay, sorry. Now it's on. Oh, now it's on. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, so first of all, I'm a I'm a physicist, so I'm not a I'm not a clinician, but uh, I think. One of the things I've really been focused on over the years is trying to address some of the clinical uh, situations and problems that we have facing us by using some advanced pulse sequence design. I'm going to hustle through an awful lot of things, and, and at the end I'll, I'll tell you what VBOX is. But uh, uh, to start out with, I just want to um, give you a motivation here. So, so very simply, the clinical radiological paradox uh, presents itself in, an, in a variety of fashions, but the one I'm going to address today is, is the fact that what we see radiologically oftentimes isn't what is manifest neurologically. So a patient comes in, he has uh, some, some deficits in walking, that's very easy to see. Oftentimes then we follow up with an imaging uh, study of the brain. Not always do we find the lesions that contribute exactly to that. So uh, what I want to address today is, is how can we kind of rectify these these um, paradox, uh, this one paradox. Uh, the, the case that I'm going to use most often today is multiple sclerosis. Many of us know, obviously, what multiple sclerosis is. We have friends and family members who have uh, this devastating disease. We know that it's marked by demyelination, by axonal damage, by inflammation. It, it has a, a severe and torturous course. It, it gets better, it gets worse. Some drugs are effective in some people, some drugs are not. But the uh, punchline of that is, is in a typical MS brain, we do an MS uh, imaging, uh, what we find is, is we find on the right, bottom right uh, post-GAD enhancing lesions. We see on the flare uh, that there are multiple uh, lesions there, thus the name multiple sclerosis. We, we know that they radiate out within the corpus callosum and in the optic radiation um, primarily. But what happens is, is that as these lesions begin to accumulate, we find that the brain is also a bit atrophic as well. So uh, as, the, as the lesions come and go, brain tissue is lost and we see this course of, of evolution of atrophy. Now interestingly, when we start looking at the literature and we say, okay, we know that multiple sclerosis has a lot of brain involvement and we use our, our, our old standby, the T2 lesion load. So we count some lesions and, and we take some area of lesions and we want to relate that to a neurological uh, assessment, the EDSS. What we find is, is that when our study numbers are quite low, we have patients that are quite few, we find that the correlation coefficients between the changes in the brain observed and the neurological status can be anywhere between zero and one. So uh, fortunately, many of us are in the, in the one category when we scan five patients, so we get all excited. And, and uh, what happens is, is when you extend this on, on out and we begin to study more and more patients, the literature suggests that there is a very poor correlation between the uh, T2 lesion load and the neurological exam EDSS thus the clinical radiological paradox that I want to address. Now, just a few facts before we get into this. Um, multiple sclerosis uh, previously is, was a brain disease. We obviously know that that's not entirely the case anymore, and that it, it um, involves the spinal cord a lot of the time. Some estimates are 50% of the time, some estimates are 90% of the time. And we also know that the optic nerve is related uh, to, to MS, but only indirectly with current infer information but the, uh, the optic nerve treatment trial suggests that uh, about 45% of patients who have idiopathic optic neuritis or optic neuritis that just pops up one day will eventually convert to MS. What we want to know is, is why. Can we take a person off the street who has optic neuritis, image them with a, a select set of techniques and say, yes, you're going to develop MS or no, you're not. That would be, that would be really nice. <coughs> so I was in Germany not too long ago and I was walking, walking down the street and I see this sign. <laughs> Of course, I have to take a picture, right? Uh, so I, I look at this, and, and uh, then it hits me. It, you know, one of the things here is, is that multiple sclerosis affects the nerve tracks, right? And uh, th the rest of the picture I was a little less enthused about, but uh, uh, the multiple sclerosis interrupts the nerve tracks. So being a, a fairly simple fellow, I say to myself, well, what are the major tracks that we want to, to explore? And then I say, well, you know, in the brain, there are thousands of them, and the brain is very complicated. So what I really wanted to do is, is I want to turn my attention to something besides the brain. 
how we're going to do that is, this is our box. This is our toolbox. What I want to talk to you about is, is the use of magnetization transfer, um, which we know is sensitive to myelin damage. We're going to uh, follow it up with a little bit of about diffusion tensor imaging. We know that's sensitive to tissue anisotropy. And lastly, I'm going I'm to bring up the idea a bit about CEST, or chemical exchange saturation transfer, because we know that that's sensitive to protein and peptides. And I'll tell you why that becomes important in just a moment. Okay? So the MT effect, we know what this is very simply. And I've used this, this uh, slide for a number of years, so Philip, I apologize if, if you've seen this uh, 10 years ago. But uh, uh, the MT effect basically says that, well, there are two uh, major species of photons that we're interested in the free water, which we can directly image, the solid phase photons, which we cannot. So by a simple experiment, we apply an off-resonance uh, RF irradiation, and we decrease the visualization of the free water pool. And that is ma it, um, made possible by exchange. And on the left, you see a uh, just a reference image of um, uh, without the MT pulse, and on the right, you see an image with the, with the MT pulse, OK? Now, the second one I'm going to talk to you about is CEST. And I bring it up now instead of after diffusion like my previous slide because it has some similarities with magnetization transfer, OK? Ma magnetization transfer we know is sensitive to rigid, solid-like structures. We know that it's uh, mediated by dipole and chemical exchange. Um, and CEST is, is effectively a specialized version of MT in that what we're looking at is, is we're looking at mobile structures that have narrow line shapes. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. And the exchange is, is mediated a lot by chemical exchange. Okay, so basically, if you want to draw this into a big umbrella, and I'm being taking a, a few liberties here, but if you want to put this under a big umbrella, then CEST is going to look at the resonances that are quite near the water. Okay? Diffusion, many of you here are quite familiar with diffusion, so I won't belabor this too much. But simply, diffusion, the idea of diffusion is, is that we're sensitive to tissue and isotropy. And that, uh, in particular structures, there's an orientation, and that orientation um, will uh, kind of dictate how the uh, water is going to diffuse. Is it going to diffuse randomly? Is it going to diffuse preferentially? And we can use a number of, of um, values here to, uh, to uh, reflect that, the mean diffusivity, the average displacement, the perpendicular and parallel diffusivity, which is the uh, diffusion along or across uh, the, the fibers, and the fractional anisotropy, which is just kind of an overall representation of the tissue anisotropy. Okay, so now you've seen the toolbox. I've motivated uh, a little bit about this, uh, about this talk by my, my picture experience in Germany. And uh, what, what we know is, is that the bulk of MRI is focused on the brain, right? But we know that the cervical cord, and we know that the optic nerve, and the thoracic cord, and the lumbar cord, are really involved in a number of diseases, not just MS. I'm going to use MS today. But um, there's a lot to be had here. And going back to my uh, German sign experience, op um, multiple sclerosis affects the nerve tracts. And I said to you, I'm a simple guy. So let's see kind of how simple I am. Well, I figure that if there are lesions that happen to small structures, and we know what those small structures do, then we can start to probe the relationship between damage to these small structures and uh, the neurological function that they are intended to perform. So the advantage of imaging small structures, and I used the word simple a bit ago, but really it's small. The advantages is, uh, uh, of imaging small structures is that most of these small structures are somatotopically organized. They do one function. So there is a structure function relationship just naturally in the tissue. Small lesions lead, uh, lead to big deficits. A two millimeter lesion in a brain that is you know, 200 millimeters across is much less dramatic than a two millimeter lesion in something that's only you know, 15 millimeters across. So you can, you can think of it just as a fractional situation here. And presumably it's easy to probe neurologically. And I'll show that to you in a bit. The disadvantage is, is that they're small, right? That makes sense. So. Um, you know, we're faced with the challenge with MRI. Our, our resolution is, is a bit limited. Uh, small structures are always protected by big bones and big um, sacks of air and any sort of mechanism because they are quite small. And the third thing is that small structures move more than big structures. That's just uh, a, known, a known fact. And the reason why is, is it's the airbag phenomenon. You want uh, these small structures to be able to move without creating trauma. Okay. So as for the first part, I'm going to address uh, the spinal cord. And we'll go through a number of, of techniques here. 
and we'll, we'll relate this to uh, the spinal cord in different aspects. But the spinal cord is very easy to probe in a lot of ways. You know, doctor, I can't walk. You know, I can't feel my feet, right? Obviously, they could have lesions in the brain. That's not what I'm trying to say here. But we know that if there are lesions in specific aspects of the spinal cord, then they're going to re result in neurological impairments as such. Okay, I want to draw you back to my attention here, or draw you your attention back to my, uh, my original plot, which shows the, uh, the correlation coefficient versus the number of patients. As my studies get big, my correlation tanks, okay? So what we said was, is let's look at the spinal cord and see if this is also the case. The anatomy of the spine, for those of you who are not spinal cord images, uh, I'm obligated to give uh, a few slides here. But the spinal cord is, um, is simply a, a white matter uh, and gray matter structure that sits inside a, a CSF donut. And that CSF donut sits inside the, the vertebral bodies. Um, and we have nerve roots, we have arteries that, uh, that go to that. And just as a, as a picture, I use this a lot in my, uh, in my classes that I teach for educational purposes to kind of give you a feeling for what the spinal cord looks like in, in the tissue, just a growth sample where you see, you see the, uh, the spinal cord as it comes out of the uh, frame and magnum here, which is the base of the skull. And you can see that there are a lot of vessels associated with it, and there are tetherings to the nerve roots. So there, there's a lot of structure going on here, sometimes a bit underappreciated, I think. But the nice thing about the spinal cord is, is we know certain things. We know the derma tanks. We know that if you can't fill pinprick at a certain level, that there's a spinal cord uh, damage at that particular level. Um, and uh, I'll show you on the right here just a picture of some of the dermatome maps that we, that we know exist. Also what we know is, is that the, there are specific tracts in the spinal cord that carry a sp uh, specific function. So these are our targets. Our, um, we're going to be a bit more coarse than some of these uh, drawings suggest, where these drawings suggest that we can look at um, um, some of the, like, in, for example, the bottom left, the autonomic efferent nuclei. I mean, we're not going to have that type of resolution in the human. But what we can look at is we can look at the ventral horns. We can look at the uh, dorsal uh, white matter, the lateral white matter. And we know that that's going to mostly um, serve the <coughs> motor function and pain sensation and, and sensory uh, function. Okay? So the hypothesis is that dorsal column lesions are going to lead to sensory deficits and that lateral column lesions are going to lead to motor deficits. Well, let's find out if that's really true. I'll show you this again a um, different way, just because I want to uh, give you the uh, feeling for the size of the spinal cord. So here's the brain, and here's the spinal cord down here. If I overlay, it's the same scale. If I overlay lower region of interest on the spine like we're on the brain, that's kind of what we're dealing with here. So now you can imagine that a two millimeter lesion in the brain is gonna have quite a bit different effect than a two millimeter lesion in the cord. Okay. What's field had to do with it? Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the field evolution, but I do want to introduce it. Um, 1.5 humans, I was so excited about this. This is one of the first images I got when I was a graduate student. And uh, everyone was blown away because we could see the butterfly pattern. And uh, then we got the 3T, and then now the 7T over on the right is kind of an old, old picture. But um, you can see that uh, field has an awful lot to do with our ability to image the spinal cord. I'm going to focus on quantitative imaging, and field has a lot, a, a big role to play, but we're not really there yet. Okay, now, clinically, what do we see? This is, this is again, I, I, I'm, I apologize that I am harping on the fact that this is a clinical radiological paradox. So here's the spinal cord of a healthy volunteer. Here's a patient with MS, and here's another patient with MS. Now, uh, to the untrained eye, maybe you, you can't see s lesions, maybe you can see lesions. It's difficult to say. It's very difficult to say which is lesion and what is not lesion. However, when we implement our NT strategies, and I'll talk about kind of uh, the impact here, we can see that in a healthy volunteer, there is no lesion in the MS region. The lesion is quite apparent. And uh, same thing here, okay? So compared to conventional imaging, our ability to see the lesions, the lesions, again, um, will show up uh, bright here in the dorsal column and bright here in the lateral column. So we get a clear picture of what's going on. The nice thing about NT is that it can be quantitative. It is semi-quantitative, to be fair, but it is quantitative in that we can compare across people at the same site. There are some normalization procedures that one can make um, to compare across uh, sites and, and vendors. But uh, in principle, if you're doing a study at the same site, you can characterize the, the NT effect and use it quantitatively. So here's the so-called magnetization transfer ratio. 
And uh, the magnetization transfer ratio, the contrast, is inverted from what I just showed you. And this is simply an experiment where you have a, uh, an acquisition with a NT saturation pulse divided by an NT, um, a, a, a scan without an NT saturation pulse, okay? So I'm going to show you some images, and uh, you know I use I use this slide a lot for teaching as well. So here we're going up the cervical level until we get to the brain. Uh, dark is bad in the NQR images. So what we what we can see is is that there is obviously some signal fall off here, uh, difficult to interpret, also difficult to interpret. Okay. So what we've worked on is over the years is developing a new technique uh, where the normalization is not uh, like this, and this is. One of the problems with, uh, with 3P imaging and where we can get around at uh, 7P is that um, the NQR just really suffers from low signal to noise in the spinal cord, okay? So this is a 31-year-old relapsing remitting patient. Obviously, you can see lesions um, in the cervical area. Um, sometimes you don't see the lesions. However, when we compare this with a, the MT-CSF or the, the MT method I just showed you recently, it becomes very obvious that there's a lot more spinal cord involvement than what we suspected. Okay? <laughs> and when we compare that to a healthy volunteer, we see that uh, this is not a healthy cord all the way through. Now, because it is quantitative, we can relate structure to function in the spinal cord. I show you a couple here where um, uh, the middle picture is an MS patient with an obvious dorsal column involvement. Uh, this uh, right here is, is a right lateral column involvement. So we would expect this particular patient to have motor deficits and this particular patient to have sensory deficits. And in fact, when we look at this one person, that's exactly what we see. Interestingly, in the patient who has um, uh, the dorsal column lesion, we see that there's an altered vibration sensation dramatically in the patient, but the strength is fairly unaltered. Con uh, alternatively, when we look at the lateral column lesion, we see that the strength is dramatically altered, but the sensation is relatively intact, okay? So it seems like there's a direct structure, structure function relationship. Um, because I'm, I'm going to cover a lot of ground, I didn't bring in the, uh, the uh, brain comparisons to show you the same relationships, how they appear in the brain, but I feel that uh, most of us know what the structure function relationships oftentimes are in the brain. You know, we, we see correlations of 30% and, and we're quite pleased with that. Um, but what we see in the spinal cord is, is that on the left side, when we look at uh, lateral column uh, MT values with ankle strength, we find that there's an, a, you know, a quite a strong significant correlation. And when we look at the dorsal column, we also see that there is a, a strong uh, correlation with uh, vibration sensation. And uh, I won't belabor this, but there is specificity in these. So the, that the uh, lateral column MT best predicts strength, whereas the dorsal column MT best predicts vibration. And if you wanna talk about this a bit later, we can, we can talk about that. So there is some structural specificity, structure function specificity. Now, where are we going with this? I showed you some correlations, I showed you some motivations. Um, I hope you can see those and they don't come out a bit too bleached. But um, what we're now focused on is quantitative MT, like true quantitative MT, where we can, we can kind of snuff out the um, uh, myelin fraction, where we can look at how much myelin is, is there relative to uh, a healthy control, how much uh, the exchange rate has been modified. That gives us some information about dysmyelination as opposed to demyelination. And we're starting to do this in healthy controls. We've done this at, um, at uh, 3P here. We've done this in some MS patients. We certainly uh, are not uh, covering really new ground here other than the fact that this is in the spinal cord. But in principle, the, um, the MS patients have a lowered, uh, what we call pool size ratio. So they have a lowered um, uh, semi-solid component, which we know to be related to myelin. So, so this is just very new. We're kind of at that cusp right now, but I wanted to, uh, to present it nonetheless. Now, um, diffusion tensor imaging. There's a, there's a lot of hubbub about diffusion tensor imaging in the spinal cord. And um, I'll just show you a few examples of, of what we're doing in the MS uh, population here, where um, obviously on the, on the left uh, middle, you see the fractional anisotropy. You can see the bright white matter and the dark gray matter. This is a fairly, uh, fairly old slide, but uh, I think it kind of shows you the contrast that we can get. And um, multimodality is really where we want to go. So uh, what, what I've talked about to this point is magnetization transfer, the MTCSF, the semi-quantitative method. I've talked a little bit uh, just briefly about the quantitative MT. And uh, again, I want this to be very fairly informal, so I'm gonna open the door in a little while uh, to, uh, to ask questions about 
these particular methods, how do we do them? I'm not spending a lot of time on how we do these, but rather what they, what they show. But the goal is, is that if we know the tracks in the spinal cord um, are related to spe a specific function, then it's, it's quite uh, interesting to, to imagine that we can start calculating the DTI parameters, the quantitative MP parameters, the CESS parameters in these individual tracks and relate those. We're just now there uh, where we're, we're a bit confident in the, uh, in the metrics themselves to begin a study that's a bit larger. But uh, the goal here it would be multimodality characterization of the spinal cord. <coughs> now I want to go back and just revisit a fairly new topic and that's chemical exchange saturation transfer. Um, this, is, this is very early data that we have, uh, but uh, I do want to show some interesting findings from that and, uh, and how we're using this in the spinal cord. Remember again that the magnetization transfer is going to be related to the semi-solid components, going to be related to big, sticky, um, rigid structures like myelin and, and membranes, whereas uh, cess, on the other hand, is going to be sensitive to mobile uh, proteins and peptides that exchange with water. Um, now, the motivation for CEST, and I'll tell you a bit more once we get to the MS population, but the motivation for CEST is, is that we know in a lot of cases that there, uh, especially in, in MS, that there is a breakdown of active transport. There's an accumulation of, of crud and junk in the, um, in the axon that doesn't get uh, cleaned away the way it should, and the axon swells, and then the eventually the myelin is, is ruptured. And we know that there's this, there's this transient process. Well. Oftentimes our techniques are only sensitive at the inflammation stage, once that this is um, uh, kind of permanent or could be permanent. Well, and we've taken a step back with MP and, and some suggest DTI as well, uh, to look at the axonal components or the myelin components. Well, what I'm motivating here is I wanna take a step back a bit further and say, can we start to detect the uh, mobile um, proteins and peptides that may accumulate prior to an overt lesion? So what are the characteristics of normal carrying white matter let's say, in, in the MS population. So, um, some just some, some brief results here in a couple of example MS patients, and I wanna kind of belabor a, a one point here in a minute. But um, you see here that uh, the anatomical image, you see obviously that there's a quite a big lesion. Um, it appears to be a bit uh, overexposed here on, on the big slide projector. But um, you see that uh, there's quite a large lesion there. And when we look at the uh, so-called APT, so this is um, basically going to be sensitive to changes in, in protein and peptide content. What we see is, is we see in the healthy volunteer that uh, there's a bit of gray white matter uh, contrast. Uh, that's certainly a, a question I would, I would like to field in after this. But in the MS population, or in this particular person, you see a lot of uh, strange uh, patterns in the, uh, in the uh, dorsal column, let's say, and certainly in the lateral column. This this lateral column that I want to, uh, I want to talk a little bit about. Well, in this lateral column, what you find is, is that the APT asymmetry, and there are certain weaknesses to this as well, but the uh, APT asymmetry is really quite elevated. Now, in data that I have not shown here, uh, it's just we, we started obtaining this yesterday, we've been able to follow a, uh, uh, an MS patient uh, through some various relapses in, in doing this, and what we see is, is that in normal appearing healthy white matter, we see an increase in, in the, uh, the cess effect at the, uh, at the APT resonance, uh, followed by a, a decrease in that same, in that same uh, measurement. And what we suspect is happening here is, is that we suspect we're becoming a bit more sensitive to accumulation of, of uh, proteins and peptides, followed by necrosis and clearing of that uh, in the later stages. So this is an area of active exploration. I'm really quite excited about it. I don't have a lot of um, uh, uh, detailed results to give you on, on the stuff yet. It's still an early study. So the question then is, is well, does SEBI bring anything to the table for spinal cord imaging that we don't really already have? And certainly I, I, would, I would argue that yes, it does. One of the biggest problems that we face with quantitative imaging is that uh, we don't have the signal to noise to be able to do a lot of the quantitative imaging methods in a fast manner, in a reasonable manner. Um, so, for example, with DTI, we're limited in our resolution for a lot of reasons. Uh, gradient strength is, is one of those as well. But um, signal to noise is a real pill when, when it comes to lower field. And we need to do this in a fast manner because this is the spinal cord. It is quite uh, motion ridden. I'll just show you some recent results. So, this is, this is the, um, uh, I should give a disclaimer here that at uh, Vanderbilt we use uh, Phillips scanners. So, this is ANOVA 
portal that was just built not too far uh, from here, actually, to have start its production. And uh, we, we began to use this at the, at the 70, really quite excited about them. Our anatomical images, um, you know, they, they have some areas of, uh, you know, obviously some, some B1, B0 and homogeneity. We're addressing that with dielectric bags and some, some other uh, <coughs> resources as well. Uh, looking at maybe smarter transmit pulses, um, uh, et cetera. But anatomically, uh, our foil is, is performing uh, decent enough that we can say, well, let's launch it into the quantitative world because uh, you know, that's, that's obviously the, the thing you want to do. If, you know, if one thing works, then let's try something that's probably not going to work and that keeps, us, that keeps us busy for a while. So quantitative imaging, um, we have revised our approach where there are multiple ways to do quantitative imaging. Um, Again, I didn't get into the methods of, of this in detail, but if you do want to know, I'm happy to talk to you about it. But at 7P, we've been able to modify our uh, QNT approach, and we've been able to, to begin to get uh, pool size ratios and, and um, exchange rates in the spinal cord uh, with pretty, pretty good, um, uh, pretty high resolution. The speed is, is the big thing. So in the, in the spinal cord at 3P, it takes 15 minutes or so to get a cervical chunk. Uh, we're here, we can cover the entire cervical segment at uh, equal resolution in about uh, uh, eight minutes or so. So we're, we're, moving, we're moving the quantitative into, into a bit more of the, the clinically acceptable realm. CEST, we've begun to do some CEST imaging of the, uh, of the spinal cord um, as well. Here, um, what you see is you see a fairly healthy uh, a person, and uh, here you see a, a patient and you see again the uh, telltale elevations um, here and you see the, uh, the uh, lower limb here. So um, a lot of work to be done here, but it just kind of sets the stage for where we want to go. Diffusion imaging, we're really quite pleased. Um, on, the, on the left, you see a non-navigated, uh, non-motion corrected uh, acquisition, multi-shot EPI acquisition at uh, 7P and then you see a, a 2D navigator over on the right and kind of how that helps. Uh, I show you this one slice because this was our good slice. Um, you know, being very honest with you about that, uh, we are struggling certainly with, with EPI of the cord at 7P, but we know uh, right up front that on the right side you see a diffusion wave image and we can see right away white matter gray matter contrast, something that we struggle with at, at 3P. So really quite excited about this, maybe implementation of, of 2D uh, navigators with um, some other tricks, uh, possibly even 3D navigation that some folks are, are decently talking about. So I want to get off the, uh, the spinal cord for a minute, and I want to talk about the next simple structure. Uh, this will be a, a fairly quick structure uh, to cover compared to the spinal cord because we've set the stage in, in the spine um, side. But we know even the spinal cord is a bit complex. You know, it has ascending fibers, it has descending fibers, there's motor function, there's sensory function, there's uh, pain function, there are uh, combinations of things, there are roots and ganglion uh, coming in together, and depending on where you are in the spinal cord, there are branches that go out, brachial plexus, you know, iliac, uh, lumbar, lumbosacral uh, plexus. Um, vision is a bit more straightforward, and I don't mean vision from the neuroscience aspect. Vision from the neuroscience a aspect quite possibly could be one of the most complicated things you've ever seen. But from the function, the structure function relationship, it, it's a bit straightforward. You know, we have an eyeball that performs some magic function, but all that information is, is mediated to the rest of the brain through the optic nerves, the optic tracks, the LGNs, the optic radiation. Um, but one of the struggles that we've had in MS, again, is in patients who have optic neuritis, is there a relationship with the eventual uh, development of the disease? Also, um, why do some patients with MS have continually uh, worsening vision? even though they don't have lesions that show up. You know, again, we're faced with the same type of paradox. So let me talk briefly about vision. The, um, the visual pathway is, is, a, is a bit straightforward. Uh, obviously, we have the, uh, the eye and the retina. At the back of the retina, it exits and goes to the optic nerve. That optic nerve goes to the optic chiasm where it partially decussates. That is, uh, some of the uh, fibers cross over to the other side. Some fibers go straight through. And then it, um, it'll synapse in the LGN, and from the LGN we have the, uh, the optic radiation that eventually goes through the occipital cortex, okay? So it's a pretty linear path, it's in the brain, but it is a bit small. So 
motivation here was that we were doing DTI of, of the brain and we were starting to parse out some of the fibers. Uh, this was back from the work I, I, was, I was doing at, uh, at Johns Hopkins. We were parsing out some of the fibers. We were looking at optic radiation. Maybe we were looking at optic tracts. We were looking at the cortical spinal tract. We were looking at the uh, uh, dorsal column medial lomeniscus. So looking at each one of these tracts and starting to try to probe those neurologically. Well, when we look at the optic radiation, that seemed like a good place to start. It's big. It's, doesn't, it's not really confounded by too much partial volume uh, contacts. When we started looking at the um, correlations with visual function, we found that the correlations were a little bit less than what we had hoped. Um, and this is a bit shocking because, you know, obviously I stand up here and motivate my talk by saying, well, if we look at small structures, then we can find a structure function relationship. We uh, looked at the spinal cord, we saw a bit of a structure function relationship with NP. But when I come to the optic uh, radiation, it's, it's small relative to the brain, yet the hypothesis is it's not small enough. There's a lot of uh, plasticity that can happen, a lot of shaping and reshaping um, that can happen when lesions occur in the optic radiation. So we say, well, what about the optic nerve? Now the optic nerve um, is just this anterior segment and uh, it comes out of the, uh, the back of the retina. Interestingly, the optic nerve is a lot like a bullseye, unlike the, unlike the uh, spinal cord, which is surrounded by CSF with gray matter inside. Um, the optic nerve has no gray matter. It has a central artery. It has some white matter around that. Uh, outside that, it's got some uh, meninges, and it has orbital fat, and then it has muscles that raise and lower the eyeball. That kind of comes called the, the rectus muscles. Uh, outside that, obviously, you have your orbit, which is a big bone. Um, so it's, it's kind of just growing in, in uh, complexity as we get further and further out. But our target here is to be able to obtain information about this guy. Now, this guy is three millimeters or so um, in some folks who have optic neuritis. Where it's swollen, it can be up to five millimeters or so. But in principle, it's three millimeters, and that's our target. Um, furthermore, the optic nerve is tethered to the back of the eyeball. So any movement of the eye is going to move the optic nerve. Um, so it's, uh, it's a bit complicated there. One of the biggest problems facing optic nerve imaging is the, th is the fact it's small. The second biggest problem, and perhaps a bigger impact, is the fact that the optic nerve sits on one of the biggest air pockets in the human body, and those are your, your uh, maxillary sinuses. So any of your EPI techniques, any of your sophisticated techniques that you want to use to obtain high resolution imaging or um, fast imaging of the optic nerve is going to suffer really bad. And this is going to be exacerbated at the higher and higher field. So in principle, if you really want to do nice optic nerve imaging, you should probably go to like zero field because you wouldn't have the effect. Um, but of course, that's not going to help us much here. So we're faced with this task. We're trying to obtain um, sub -millim you know, millimeter resolution or so uh, in, in a structure that's moving all over the place and sitting on the biggest air pockets in the body. So uh, a bit of a challenge, nevertheless, with uh, some, some sequence uh, details. This is a single shot sequence, um, and I'll talk to you more about a, uh, a multi-shot sequence in just a moment. But uh, with single shot, uh, you can see here that uh, the fractional anisotropy highlights this quite well, is that we have the uh, a CSF surrounding the optic nerve. The optic nerve here looks just like a blip. Um, and we look at our diffusion parameters. Our MP parameters, uh, of course, are really quite problematic here. Um, I can discuss that in a bit as well. So this is a healthy volunteer. Um, so, you know, what we want to ask the question is, is what, is the, what are these parameters going to tell us about when in the relationship to the clinical? The MT problem that we have is motion. Um, uh, we recently have begun to address this, but uh, I still leave this in just for a, an impression of what are some of the problems that, that face us with the, uh, the optic nerve. If we look at an MS patient, uh, what we know is, uh, again, if you look at the bottom, OD and OS, uh, OD is going to be your right side and OS is going to be your left side. Um, uh, your ophthalmologists uh, like to uh, like to use the, the old Latin words for left eye and right eye. But um, in the MS patient, what you see is in the left eye, there is a kind of a fading of the bright spot that you would see in the FA. Um, you can see it kind of throughout. There's a, there's a fading uh, effect associated here. And um, so what we know at this point is, is we know that we can uh, resolve the optic nerve in patients with MS. The concern was in patients with MS that there's going to be a sufficient amount of atrophy that's going to take our nerve from three millimeters down to two millimeters or one millimeter. And, and it appears that in the early stages, uh, we have not scanned a lot of older folks with MS, but in our um, sub-40-year-old 
populations within those patients, we find that the atrophy is not playing a big role. But now we can study, though, the, the correlations uh, with respect to controls, and uh, we can distinguish your eyes unless they're handy. So first of all, we did a uh, just a cohort study of 39 EMS patients and 10 healthy volunteers. What we find is, is that the fractional anisotropy, the mean diffusivity, and the perpendicular uh, diffusivity are all significantly different in our EMS population. Now, you say, well, we're not really surprised. Well, here's the thing is, is this is a blended MS population. Not all of these people have had optic nerve damage. Not all of these folks have had um, uh, known visual changes. So in this population, just of plain MS patients, uh, I say plain, I mean, obviously it's a complex disease, but in this, in this um, cohort, there is a statistically significant abnormality compared to healthy controls. And this kind of jumps right out at our hypothesis at the, at the start is that well, we know that optic neuritis is, relati is related to MS. Perhaps we can get some access to the prognosis uh, by looking at this and, and uh, go beyond the, if I've had a visual event, then I don't have, uh, I know that I'm gonna have visual damage. Well, we're starting to move into the, the world where even if you don't have a visual event, there is some damage that we can pick up. Now, where this becomes um, a bit exciting is, is when we start to look at the correlation testing. In folks with a history of optic neuritis, so they report um, that at some point in their life they had some visual changes that was instantaneous, or that were instantaneous, and they, uh, they lost their vision maybe for a day, or maybe they had double vision for a bit. And what we did was we looked at the um, correlations between uh, retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. Okay, so that was measured by OCT for those of you who, who know what OCT is. But basically, it takes a, a snapshot at the, at the thickness of the, um, the health and welfare, really, of the, the retinal nerve fiber um, layers at the back of the retina and at the, at the nub of the optic nerve. <coughs> and um, so what we found was that th there was a strong significant correlation with uh, all of our DTI parameters and the OCT, okay? That's not, uh, that's not entirely surprising because we're so well um, connected spatially. But what was I interesting was is that the perpendicular diffusivity related to all of our imaging findings, or all of our non-imaging findings, so retinal nerve fiber layer thickness, 100% uh, contrast visual acuity. And if you recall back to that plot I showed you a bit ago, where we, we said we weren't real happy with the correlations, those correlations were down um, below 30%, um, so we're now we're at uh, almost you know, 0.48 correlation here. Um, so. And then where it really becomes exciting is it's at 1.25% contrast visual acuity. And that quite possibly is the most frustrating exam that you can ever have, but it really does get access to the health of the optic nerve because it's a, uh, it's a visual chart like you would normally have, except they, they take the black letters and they make them 1.25% uh, the contrast normally. So they're basically like a faded gray sheet and they ask you to read the letters. Most healthy people can't get below, below the second level, which is uh, really naturally frustrating. But um, the perpendicular diffusivity there is quite well related to the, um, to the um, um, visual function, okay? So the last bit I want to talk about, I have maybe five minutes here, so left. Um, the uh, uh, pulse sequence modification. And uh, you know, part of what I want to present is, is the, yes, we can do certain things, but we're running out of gas on some certain other things. So, one of the pulse sequence modifications that we've made is, is we've done, we've begun to use a 2D navigated multi-shot um, EPI for our diffusion. So what we'll do is we'll have an imaging readout and then we'll have a navigating readout on the back side of that. And uh, the idea of the navigator is you're gonna create, uh, correct the, the uh, phase related uh, problem. It's gonna multi, um, a, um, a uh, multiple, uh, multi-shot EPI, sorry. And, um, the uh, first pass, we're like, well, you know, I'm sure that this is this is going to be better. But the goal of this, remember, I said it was six line reconnaissance. So your single shot EPI is really hindered because if we want to go to higher and higher resolution, then our EPI training can get longer and longer, and our sensitivity to PT star effects and inhomogeneities is going to go right through the roof. So we need to have some way that we can get higher resolution, even at the trade off of higher of longer scan times. The motivation there is to do a multi shot sequence. Our initial experience with this, um, so what you're looking at is, is this is a, um, a uh, multi, 
Yeah, this is a multi-slice spin SO single shot EPI. Okay. And when we compare this at uh, with with the multi-shot, what we see is is that the multi-shot here, you can see that the images are a bit clearer than the um, the single shot. But um, this was just like the first pass. And then what we want to do is we want really want to start pushing the resolution. Can we get down to one millimeter, one point two millimeter, whatever? And and what you see is is that in the single shot experiment, um, in this particular case, we can't even see the optic nerve on this side. We know it's there. The patient obviously obviously has one, but we can't see it. The distortions and the inhomogeneities and the motion and the QT star effects leave the single shot uh, completely unintelligible. When we hop over here to our multi shot sequence, uh, I believe this is. Uh, um, three shots. We can see the optic nerve in all of our slices. Uh, this is just FA. And um, then when we look at the uh, diffusion weighted scans, um, here you see this is a one millimeter in plane. This is a non diffusion weighted uh, B0. Um, and this is a non diffusion weighted single shot. So our multi shot and our single shot are really um, quite dramatically different here. This is uh, without navigation. This is with navigation. You can see the diffusion weighting of the nerve quite well. And this is the, the diffusion weighting of the single shot. You can s compare these two um, visually. So we're really excited about this new modification. We've just now uh, began to study this in, in a, a large number of, of uh, folks. So we suspect that in the, in the uh, original case, the single shot was quite well correlated. We suspect that the multi-shot is also going to be quite well correlated, if not a bit better. Now what 7P had to bring to the table, I just showed you one anatomical image because I think this really gets at the heart of what we're trying to show. Remember I told you that the optic nerve is primarily white matter and that there's this defecation and it gets a bit, a bit wacky once it goes to the chiasm. But what I didn't tell you was is that there are different quadrants in the optic nerve and depending on where lesions occur on those quadrants tell you whether or not you lose this field or this field or this field or this field or perhaps collar, maybe you lose red collar, maybe you lose green collar, etc. This is a case of optic neuritis. Um, and the healthy, the control eye, uh, you see in 3T, you don't see much, you see a little bit of CSF. And you look at the 17, you're like, well, Seth, I'm not very impressed by that. That's not a very good image. Um, and I wasn't either until I looked at the other eye. And when I looked at the other eye, what we see is, is that the uh, P2 at 3T uh, is quite, uh, uh, it's a bit bigger, but you don't really see much going on in there. When I hopped over 7P, what we see is, is we see one punctate lesion in one quadrant. Um, so, and it directly related to their uh, specific vision loss. So, you know, this is almost a, an example of like subclinical uh, optic neuritis. Uh, we knew the neurologically what had happened, ophthalmolo ophthalmologically what happened, but uh, for the first time we're starting to see this uh, in real life. So. Um, just as, a, as one last anecdote, a, a patient was brought over to the uh, uh, Vanderbilt Imaging Institute the other day. They thought that uh, there was a third cranial nerve lesion uh, because there was uh, sub some inability to raise and lower the eye the way they were supposed to. They did an imaging uh, uh, scan at uh, 3T. They found nothing. They brought them over and said, can you find it? And uh, we found a sizable lesion in the, in the third cranial nerve that was quite visible at the 7P. It was not the 3T. So in the visual sciences, um, I believe that simply just gaining a, a greater uh, bit of resolution is going to be helpful. In the spinal cord, I think it's the signal to noise that's going to drive our quantitative metrics that's going to be quite handy in the end. So um, with that, I just want to wrap up. I motivated all this by the clinical radiological paradox as it pertains to MS. And that is, is what we see neurologically is not what we get radiologically. The focus then was to look at small structures. And in some cases, the structures weren't small enough. And we looked at the spinal cord and we showed that quantitative MRI can be done in the spinal cord. And that it, it uh, some of them relate to functional deficits. Obviously, we need some more um, folks to take up the charge and do larger studies to be able to know the impact down the road. And then we looked, uh, it turned our attention to the optic nerve and uh, it showed that uh, it does relate to uh, visual uh, dysfunction and OCP. And that uh, in, in fact, 7P may provide us the ability to image the quadrants of the optic nerve and to relate directly to the optic nerve uh, deficit that we see ophthalmologically. So um, there are a lot of people that have, that have played a role in this. My, my colleagues at uh, King McCready and John Hopkins, where I, I used to be, my colleagues at, at uh, Imaging Institute at uh, Vanderbilt in neurology and ophthalmology. 
And uh, with that, I went uh, a couple minutes over, but I'd certainly like to close and welcome any questions that you all have. So thank you for your time. Assumption that uh, it, it's uh, primarily been an you know adaptive nature for all of them, but um, here in uh, Bowling Hills, we have a, a group within that same process who are thinking about using the drug or you know computer based drugs to use in science. And I know there's been ambiguities with uh, people trying to do surrogate specific trials with the uh, what we're seeing in uh, what we're seeing in uh, There are some things where there's a process that doesn't take place at the HCC or any kind of system at the HCC to certain um, trials because in, in principle they can serve as that kind of thing where it's a, a, a some kind of a, a full size ratio in principle will not be denied that. So that would get the Thank you. 